from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I am your host, Tyler Jorgensen. And today we have all the way from the frosty north, uh, the beautiful Boise, Idaho. We have Thomas McMahon. And Thomas is the senior business development manager at a place called ClickBank. And if you've been in internet marketing, direct response, or if you've just been selling stuff online, you know about ClickBank. Uh, They're a really cool company that helps uh, merchants and product and offer owners sell more product through a team and network of affiliates. But they're doing a lot more than that. So we're going to talk not only about what's going on at ClickBank, but also how Thomas got here and and his six years there and what else he's seeing in the market and the industry. Welcome out to the show, Thomas. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Tyler. This is is going to be great. Yeah. It's going to be wild and exciting and and beautiful Boise. I'm going to put it on a t-shirt now. It's a thing. It's grown Um, fast, man. It's been been crazy being up here. Yeah. (laughs) We just call it California North now. Yeah, exactly. essentially. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, super uh, awesome to have you out. I think you and I first met four or five years ago. You were just getting started. I think you were still in your first role at ClickBank. Uh, I think we met through the ClickFunnels community. Let's go right off the bat. What has changed in direct response in the last five years? Like, what are some of the big, like, oh man, this is different? Yeah, I think compliance is always something that direct response has to be knowledgeable about and concerned about a little bit, right? And that's something that we've seen shift pretty dramatically. When I first started at ClickBank about six years ago, we had just rolled out a big compliance shift and really updated our compliance policies, which upset a lot of existing clients because they had to go change sales letters and all kinds of sales copy and stuff like that. A year after that, two years after that, you know, Facebook started implementing a lot of the same stuff we had. And then Google is implementing a lot of that stuff too. So we're seeing this big shift across the market over the last five years. And it's not really compliance in some cases, it's more user experience across Facebook's environment, Google's environment, things like that, which kind of bleeds across the whole industry. So now when we see a quote unquote, a very aggressive sales page, it's actually not as aggressive as we used to see because they're building a page compliant air quotes for Facebook. And it turns out that's pretty close to what we need too. So we're seeing this overall shift of like direct response becoming more branded, branded becoming more direct response because they need better conversions is kind of, I wouldn't say it's met in the middle yet, but the two sides are starting to get closer to each other. I think we're going to continue to see that with direct response and e-com slash brand becoming more synergistic. Um, I totally agree. And I, I, I see a lot of direct response brands, right. That used to just be, they would launch a, a new product and it would be kind of a fly by night thing. It ran its life cycle. And then when it died, it died. But now they're realizing, hey, we're building a customer base, we're building a list, we're building all of this. Why wouldn't we leverage that to whatever the next thing that's coming for that niche is? And so we're, but you're right. I don't think they've quite met in the middle, but I am seeing more direct response brands make it into retail. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of owning a brand. And then I am seeing more, um, absolutely what you said, more brands who didn't really understand the direct response space starting to use more and more of those tactics and those yep. things. So maybe for those who are listening, who understand products and, and branding, but don't maybe understand direct response. Can you kind of define that for them? Yeah, I look at it a few different ways. I look at it as direct response to me is you're wanting someone to take an action right now. So when I look at it in a term of ClickBank environment or my environment, it's more sales is the action we want to happen. So direct response to me is driving sales day zero or as close to day zero as you can for that traffic or that audience or that potential customer hitting your sales page versus more of an e-com environment, which might be you know up to 14 touch points. So as you get here, thrown around the industry and multiple things like that. So the first touch of a brand is just to get them retargeted and kind of get more experiences with your brand versus a direct response environment, which is, no, this is designed to bring someone who's cold to this sales page and now get them converting and buying today. That's kind of the big breakdown for us. And it is a major difference between the two. And it's interesting to me. I, I was talking once with a guy who had been a vice president of marketing for SeaWorld, right? Oh, and okay. He, yeah. he, he had, I think he was like their CMO. I mean, he, he was high up there for a while. And we were talking about online ads. And he said, well, he's like, I just think it's, it's a waste. If I could put money into <laughs> online ads or if I could buy a Super Bowl ad, I'm going to buy a Super Bowl ad. And it was like, nothing had been more clear of the difference between old school thought and new school thought, which is just all he wanted was impressions. He's like, I can look at the impression I can make. And I'm like, but that's, 
look how long it's going to take you to track whether that was effective. Right. And like that's, so not only <laughs> is it a two different schools of thought, but one has data and analytics and, and a whole strategy to get them to take action and like, on a short term instead of over a long over time, right? But I am seeing, like you said, that more direct response people are also building in brand style, uh, like actual branding, but also branded touch points and making sure that they mm-hmm. are following up and nurturing and building a relationship with these with the new customer, which is cool. Yeah, I think you're seeing, you know, it's getting so expensive to run traffic now in places like Facebook, which is so popular to run traffic on. And people are starting to realize like, wow, going for a straight conversion campaign on Facebook gets super expensive. But if I like in a performance performance marketer slash direct response marketer, but if we can go for video view campaigns and get, you know, impressions going back to that, you know, for pennies on the dollar compared to a conversion or a click, and then we bring the warm audience and put them in front of conversion, right? They're starting to think like a e-commerce or traditional brand would just to drive the cost down. And same with e-com, when they get direct response, best practices on their sales pages, they can roll that out across their e-com experience and conversions lift across the board. And that's where we're starting to see that kind of shift both ways. I am, man. It makes a ton of sense. I I think that uh, you you were not always a direct response business development manager, right? How did you stumble into the world of marketing? What was that first (laughs) domino that led you here? Well, gosh, of, of all things, a creative writing major um, <laughs> out of uh, College of Idaho, or the only reason why I went to school there was to play tennis there and then kind of fell into creative writing because I got bored with the business classes I was taking because I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I started, uh, I got my first job out of college with that esteemed creative writing major was doing guest blog writing for minimum wage for a link building agency here in Boise. And that's where I got started cutting my teeth into SEO and content marketing and kind of cold outreach, really, just to get guest blogs across the web. And kind of worked my way up at that company till I was managing a team there and kind of realized I wanted to kind of expand out of SEO and kind of learn more of the marketing angle. And lo and behold, ClickBank is based in Boise. So yeah, that worked out. <laughs> yeah. It, but it's writing and copy is mm-hmm. probably one of the most undervalued, in my opinion, parts of the marketing makeup. Um, so many times people will come to me and they come to our team and say, Hey, we, I want a funnel built. I'm like, cool. Do you have the copy? No, just, just make it look good. And I'm like, that's yeah, <laughs> words work. And then design supports the words. And so it's interesting that you started as, as a writer and kind of got started in that and saw, Oh, okay. There's, there's different parts of copy, right? There's just general content and then there's sales copy and, and there's all these other things and they all have different value to like what it can actually drive for the business. So you've been at, at ClickBank for a, quite a while now. What are some big trends you're seeing here as we wrap up this year and go into next year? What's happening in the direct response? What kind of, what kind of offers are taking off? What's happening? Yeah, the biggest shift I've seen in the last, I'd say, 18 months, um, obviously COVID was a big you know, level setter, kind of really raised the bar for e-commerce in general. But with that, we've seen an increase in pricing um, that's been pretty surprising. And that's not just on the front end price, but more in like the bundling packages that we're seeing, right? We're seeing, I think Alex Hermosi is partially you know, responsible for this with his million dollar offer book and things like that, right? And how to add all this value, make an offer so good you can't say no to. Yeah, but marketers have gotten very good at bundling, let's say a supplement bundle and anchoring a higher price point for a single bottle and driving people to the three or six for X dollars off per bottle. And people want a deal. And that's always been around. That's not new by any means. But the way I've seen it leveraged in the last 18 months has led to massive scale because now the average order value is increased by 100% than what it used to be. And now you can pay all that to the affiliate or to Facebook to acquire the customer. And that just kind of fuels that customer acquisition fire that's kind of been breeding there. So that's been the biggest shift I've seen. There's been all these little hacks and stuff as far as conversion optimization goes, but that increased AOV on the front end for a direct-to-consumer product that's not, quote unquote, a high ticket product, but it's bringing the AOV into that $250 plus range is what's really kind of sparked a lot of these big offers. Yeah. Now, and and ClickBank, avoided doing supplements for a long time, but you guys have been doing that now for a few years. One of the other major changes recently has been like iOS 14. So people mm-hmm. are drastically looking for alternative traffic sources. Now, and ClickBank, you don't, you don't consider yourself a traffic network. You're, a, you're an affiliate network, but have you noticed um, your traffic partners really being more aggressive, looking for new traffic? Like, what are you seeing happening in that space? Yeah, a lot of people have pivoted to YouTube. Um, this, this, it seems it's slowed down a little bit. I think YouTube's been catching up to some compliance pieces there and things like that. But especially, you know, six plus months ago, a lot of people were 
testing YouTube and getting traffic going over there because Facebook was just getting so hard to work with on right. not just the cost, right, but how aggressive they are on different accounts. Um, obviously, TikTok is there. We've seen a lot of media buyers playing with the TikTok platform. Their compliance is very strict. So you need the right offer and kind of right creative team to make that work. But I don't think anyone's surprised to hear that TikTok's been taking off for people. And right. then also native. That's the other big one I've seen people pivoting over to native to figure that out. Um, especially with how many more people are online now, thanks to COVID, native has really surged up in popularity with affiliates. Now, define native for someone that may be new to this space. Yeah, native just meaning like if you're scrolling through msnbc.com or something and seeing the ads that pop up in those environments or kind of media channels, um, taking out ads and kind of drive another warm up lander for that. And people are getting very smart with how they're doing it all, but that's kind of that native environment I'm talking about there. I guess technically Facebook's a native environment, but it's so kind big. Of, it's but its, own it's so source, big. But... It's own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I started advertising on Facebook when it was just like Facebook. You didn't have business manager, you didn't have ads manager, you didn't have yeah. anything like that. And so, and it was really easy. But I also remember when you could run a banner ad uh, on, on Google Display Network before it was even called that. And it was super cheap and you got major CPMs, right? And I, we noticed this, I think. There's a lot of people that just got started in marketing in the last three or four years that really only ever learned Facebook. Mm-hmm. And it always made me, it was an interesting thing for me when they would call themselves a traffic expert or anything like that. When I'm like, you know, one platform, you got to study, you got to see what's happening because what's happening right now isn't new, right? This happen all the time. Right. There's, a, there's a cheap traffic source that comes up, everyone exploits it, then they've got to tighten compliance, they got to make changes or, or Apple or somebody else makes an adjustment that impacts them. Um, I mean, I was selling supplements. I started my brand over 10 years ago and we could advertise it on Google, no problem. But then Google came through and said, hey, you can't advertise this product on here. 95% of the businesses went out of business. But I'm like, look, traffic is still out there. Your offer has got to be positioned different. You can't just have a basic listing. You now need to have that, like you said, a a sales page or a warm up page or something. And then it's going to, you got to get more sophisticated and more uh, as these kind of things change. What has there been any interesting offers that you've seen over the past little while? Like, was there one that was just like, this is never going to work and it just totally surprised you? (laughs) Yeah, there's one out there now that I, we we do like a top offers on ClickBank every month kind of highlight. And there's one that's been there for the last like 14 months and it just sticks there. And it, it's a hyper, it's called hype stretch, hyperbolic stretching, but like hyper stretch. And it's basically teaching men or females, depending on which lander you hit, how to do the splits. And it's, <laughs> that's such a COVID thing. Like people like, oh, I've got time at home. I'm going to learn a new skill, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's lots of, you know, weight loss supplements and stuff. They're selling really well, but this one's sure. just a steady Eddie performer, just consistent five figure gross revenue a day, just like kind of turns it out. And they're just, it's a great clean offer. You can run on multiple different traffic channels. And we've seen that too. I think like these niche, I mean, riches are in the niches. Everyone says that, but people are able to find that kind of like little, you know, this is in the health niche. So it's very wide. It kind of targets an older demographic where flexibility is an issue and they kind of want to hit that, but they make it a fun kind of, you, you want to scroll through the page, no matter who you are, just to see these, all these testimonials of people doing splits. You're like, man, I could do this. Right. And it's 37 bucks. And that's an easy yeah. kind of like, sure, we'll try it. Right. So yeah. Yeah. When, that one, when that I that first one got started in online marketing and I would hear things like what you just said, that you said so casually, a $37 offer is doing a consistent five figures a day. And I'm, I just was like, that's not possible, right? That's not possible <laughs> yeah. for an extended period of time. There's not that many people that would want to buy it, but there are like, I don't think people realize just how many consumers there are in the U S like it's insane. And how yeah, many and dollars are being too, transacted? You can serve thing. internationally. Yeah. It's, sure. it's, it's silly. No, it's, there's, yeah, that's a thing. You're not going to run out of audience, you know, with that kind of volume and scale. And it's just, yeah, they and they're 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 I don't know if they're clever or not. I kind of, <laughs> but they run into um, they're very controlled with the affiliates they allow. It's a gated offer. It's not wide open to the network, so they always have you know a vetted source of affiliates coming in. So what they're doing there is instead of going big like they could probably and doing you know tens of thousands you know of sales a day or kind of thing, they're controlling it with a select you know half a dozen or a dozen affiliates a month promoting it. When they kind of fatigue, they'll add another one in. And they're not just letting everyone run it at once. They're keeping it. And they'll probably be selling this for the next five plus years, right? At this kind of volume. So it's like, it's really cool to see. Yeah, that's, it is very cool to see. What, um, 
how much does ClickBank do? Like, does ClickBank have like, here's our best day ever? Or, you know, because you've been there, what, six years now? I mean, you've seen yeah. a lot of growth. Um, and ClickBank's been around a long time. So mm-hmm. you, they were also one of the early kind of affiliate uh, networks. What's a banner day for you guys? Uh, yeah, I can't get too specific. Just yeah, a private yeah, company fine. and all that kind of stuff. But of course. I can say, right, like, gosh, with adding, like you mentioned, like we're kind of slow to get into supplements. We're pretty cautious and in, getting into new markets just because we don't want to kind of step into compliance, hot water. We kind of make sure the process is there and kind of roll right. out slowly. But just for context, right, you know, we were a... Let's put it this way. In Idaho, we were a top 100 um, Idaho private company. This last month, we just got the award. We're a top 15. Um, so in the last 10 years, right, we've been growing pretty quickly and tremendously in the e-com space. The, what that's meant in like adding supplements, for example, being able to sell kind of physical goods in that regard. So physical goods now probably make up 60 to 70% of overall volume. Wow. And we haven't, and that's, that's not eating up volume from digital, Digital has grown as well year over year. So you can imagine just being able to more than double your business with another vertical or another avenue of products, what that can do from daily sales volume. I'll say this, like some of the daily sales metrics I can share or like it'd yeah. be like a, I think the daily sales record right now for a single vendor and a single day is right around 3.2 million. And that's that's not common, right? That's a banner day for that of course. vendor. Yeah, it's a, a unicorn, but it's still, it's still yeah. awesome to hear. Yeah. And that's doing like, that was like a closed launch, right? A 10 day launch or the high ticket product um, kind of hitting that launch period window big. We're starting to see now some supplement sales though, like in the kind of the supplement niche, right? We've seen, gosh, a few banner days for different offers doing gross, you know, million dollar days, $800,000 days has become kind of like that. Whoa, they had a really good day <laughs> kind of thing coming out of nowhere. But it's so, no longer yeah. like, it's not unheard of anymore. Yeah. Like yeah, a million no, dollar day and is not like, Hey, stop the presses. We got to call like, it's like, Oh, that's amazing. But it, yeah, it's you still know. a big launch. Right. But it's like, Oh, this yeah. is going well. And the things it's that's like, really cool. cool. So yeah, I think the baseline from when I started six years ago has just, you know, if not doubled, that's close to it as far as like what a good day is on average. And the other funny part too, we're seeing is that Q3, Q4 would always be like kind of the quiet part in direct response. But right now we've got, we're having record sales days for supplements in November, December. it's like, okay, this is cool. Like, <laughs> so the market shifted a bit, probably thanks to COVID and things like that. But, sure. you know, we're seeing this like stable sales period where Q1 is always bigger, but it's not like this fall off throughout the year that we're used to seeing. Things have just kind of stayed and even gotten better as the year goes on. That's really neat. That's an interesting trend to to kind of explore a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So as you've been growing in, you know, I, I was talking with you before the show that a little bit as a intrapreneur, right? You, as a business development manager, you have to see what's workings and and come up with ideas, help onboard these offers. How have you grown as, you know, as a marketer and as a as yeah. an entrepreneur over the past few years? Yeah, I've been very humbled to be where I am. Like I get that question a lot when I'm traveling for ClickBank and going to these masterminds full of successful entrepreneurs and stuff. And the question pops up like, why haven't you done your own thing yet? Because that's kind of been the career track for ClickBank salespeople as they kind of figure it out and go do their own thing. Right. Part of it is, you know, being a salesperson means I make commission and my commission is only limited to the amount of business I can bring on. So the more business I bring to ClickBank, the more I get paid. Yeah. In the last few years, I've been able to bring a lot of business to ClickBank. So it's been, you know, good career growth for me in that regard. And then too, like you mentioned, I get to see behind the scenes, not just on the copy and like the hook angles and things like that, but really what's more telling that I don't think a lot of people understand is the back end operations of a business. Oh, yeah and how important that is. People think that this offer fatigued because the hook was tired or something, or the marketing angle was exhausted. And like you just mentioned, there's so many customers out there. That's rarely the case. Usually it's the backend stress and the operations can't grow. I'm just going to realize that I've gotten very good at what I do right now and I'm still learning a lot. And I can make a very good income for myself and my family by being a good salesperson for ClickBank is very mutually aligned and I get to learn a ton. I don't have to add on that stress of being a full-on entrepreneur and have it all on my shoulders right now. Totally. I can still, right, kind of operate as that entrepreneur as we're talking about. And that's been well, really- I've, I've seen people leave positions like what you're yeah. talking about mm-hmm. and they'll oftentimes do okay for a little while, but what they do, because what you just said, they don't have the experience of being the business owner. They might've had a good offer, but they didn't have the rest of their systems in place. They didn't understand, oh, I've got to have fulfillment. I need to have customer service. I need to have all of these other things. They got really good at one piece. And so I'm like, okay, you've either got to go now add a massive skill of managing all of that, 
or you can just continue to thrive and doing what you're doing. (laughs) You know, it's not, I don't see it as a negative, right? I, I think what you're doing is really neat because if you do your job well, not only do you make money, but you help all these other brands succeed. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and help. And I think that's huge because having been an offer owner and brand owner, if you don't have a good team of people like that, you can have the best off in the world. And that old idea that if you build a better mousetrap, the whole world will beat down to their door to find is absolutely false. They won't know it exists. <laughs> yeah, so if you can't get it out in front of people and position it right, it's dead. And so I think it's really cool what you do as you've been, you know, continuing to grow within the company and grow your own experience and your own skills. How does that help you be able to better onboard and help somebody be successful with you guys? Totally. Gosh, but my confidence level right now of taking a business that's anywhere from thinking about starting to multiple eight figures and seeing levers for them to pull to grow has just grown tremendously, right? Like I know I can hop on a call with almost anybody in that kind of demographic like, okay, here's what you say you want to do. Here's where you're at now. Here's the blockers you're hitting. Here's where you need, here's either who you know you need to go talk to. Here's what you need to hire for. Here's the systems you need in place to grow and just help them knock it out. And it's like, well, not so much to help them knock it out, but point in the right direction for them to go do it. Because that's what I'm kind of looking at when I'm looking at new offers to come on board. It's really peeling back the data and like how it's performing, but also what people do they have in place for growth? Where are they going to hit? Because that's going to impact the frontline sales growth too, like we're just talking about. So that's just kind of where I've kind of had a lot of fun. It's not so much like, I realize like owning an offer, it doesn't mean I'm more successful. I can just, I can help look behind the scenes at a business and almost consult with them on a strategic level. And that's super fulfilling for me when someone takes action there and you see the business grow. It's like, yeah, that's more fun to me than seeing a daily sales number for an offer that I might in theory own, right? So, yeah. Yep. I think a lot of people think that when they get listed on ClickBank, oh, it's it. I'm off to the races, <laughs> right? Yeah. I got it. I went, it's not super easy. It's probably better now, but like, I, you know, listing your offer takes mm-hmm. a few steps. It's not just like throwing up an eBay listing. And so you got to go through all these steps. You got to get it ready. But then, then the work starts, right? So what is a successful... <laughs> ClickBank affiliate do to go from just getting the pro- like their offer listed to actually making it win. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I always say like you've done the hard work of building your offer or product. Now you're doing the harder work of selling it, right? Yeah, and that's, that's a great way to say it. Yeah, and it's it's so true. It's like the if you put it up, they don't necessarily come, and that's sometimes it happens and it works out. But the ones that do it right, I think what people what I try to preach is that working with affiliates is B2B sales. And if you don't have a good B2B sales structure of actually kind of working with people, building rapport, understanding it's a long sales cycle, all this kind of stuff, you're going to run into a lot of frustration and kind of get your teeth kicked in a little bit when you're trying to onboard and work with affiliates. Because it's understanding that these performance affiliates that kind of live in like the ClickBank style ecosystem, they are running a business. They need ROI on their time. And if people get frustrated because they go, oh, I've got this new offer. I just need affiliates to test. But if you're asking affiliates to test an unproven offer, they're taking a big risk, even if it might be quote unquote free traffic on an email list they have. It's not really free. Not free. It's opportunity cost. Yeah, right? Exactly. Opportunity cost. If they promote your offer and it doesn't convert when they could have promoted offer A, they've just lost that difference. So it's kind of understanding that environment and then being able to like, okay, either I need to go test or to understand I need to kind of pay to play to get data. And then that gets a lot easier to actually work with affiliates. So I'd say that step A is make sure it's an actual tested converting offer and not just this thing you've built and you hope it converts. So don't use the ClickBank affiliates as you're testing. Use that to scale. Yeah, exactly. What the metaphor I use a lot is like we can help pour a lot of gasoline on a fire, but if the spark isn't there, you just got a lot of damp sticks, right? That smell bad. So <laughs> it's solid, a, solid analogy. Yeah, you need um, you need something moving there for things to happen and kind of take off. We we say the same thing in our agency. We're like, look, we're really good at amplifying what works. Yeah but you can't amplify something that hasn't been tested. So that's okay. Like if we need to start with testing, let's just recognize that's where we're at, right? Yeah. And that's where you see like those e-com brands like, oh, we got this great product. And it's like, they've got this product image page kind of thing. And it's like, for that to work with a performance affiliate, you're asking that affiliate to go make basically all your marketing assets at that point, you know, from sales page to bridge page, to swipes, to whatever you might need. And that's, most affiliates aren't going to do that. Um, they're going to look at what's easy to promote and slot in and test quickly. And asking them to do all this legwork is not fast or easy or lucrative. It's like looking at what's, uh, what, I think Joe Polish says this a lot. What's elf? 
easy, lucrative, and fun. Yeah, I like it. Half, acronym of hard, his. annoying, lame, and frustrating. So if you're not making it L for affiliates, you're going to be, yeah, it's going to be a lot of uh, a tough road to hoe. I uh, I always forgot the other hat, like I, or half. I, I always yeah. remember ELF and ELF. I, like Joe keeps things really simple in his how he like teaches. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So you've done some cool things. You had some bucket list items. Share those and then tell us what you got coming up this next year. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I've been... Uh, putting myself out there more on camera. Like if you kind of go look at ClickBank and stuff, you'll see me on the YouTube channel and the affiliated podcast we host and things like that. Um, so that's been cool to kind of just break out of my comfort zone and kind of do more on screen quote unquote time, which has led to some more live speaking engagements. I got to speak at Affiliate Summit East on stage, which led me to speaking at Traffic and Conversion. I remember being at TNC, you know, three or four years ago, looking at the speaker lineup going, it wasn't so much a goal for me to speak there, but it was like one of those goals is like, man, I want to have the authority in a space where I could speak at this kind of thing and have that. Right. Right. And then I got to speak there. I, you know, I got to have two slots that they're remote and then another one of their side stages there and things like that. So that was a big piece for me. And then just, you know, internally at ClickBank, I surpassed some big milestones as far as sales goals and kind of multipliers there and things like that. So we're cool. just kind of trying to build on that. What I'm really stoked for is what you're going to see from the ClickBank marketing side. Like I mentioned, our affiliated podcast, you're going to see a lot more from that piece of things, the guests we bring on and kind of how we distribute that. Um, and let's adjust a lot more content catering to the intermediate to advanced marketer from ClickBank, which I'm really excited that you want. That's cool. Yeah, I've noticed you guys have massively been increasing your amount of output and from a content perspective where it seemed like you used to just kind of stay behind the scenes and let the let the performance of the uh, affiliates kind of bring in other people, but, and I mean, you'd be at events and stuff, but it's cool to see you guys creating content and putting more out there. Um, and it's cool to see you being more out there. I think that's really neat. You know, I I've seen it, I've noticed, um, <laughs> you know, which is cool. One thing I always ask people is that business and all of this, right. It's great that you achieve these sales goals, mm -hmm. but it's about building a life that you actually love. What's a major item on your personal bucket list you're going to accomplish in the next 12 months. So uh, I've golf has become a big passion of mine in the last three years or so. Um, I hit some big personal checklist items this last year. I hit both my goals, which is to break 90 um, and then to get a handicap, um, like a bogey handicap, 18 handicap, right? The, the funny part is I did break 90. I shot a 78, which if you're a golfer, you probably won't believe me since I was like a 23 handicap and I just had a career round. But I still haven't shot in the 80s. So I want to get to a consistent place where I'm shooting in the 80s, um, you know, like a 15 handicap kind of place. And then uh, for me, really, it's I, I've always struggled to turn off work, right? And kind of be at home with our toddler and with my wife and things like that. Um, so big thing focus for me going to 2022 is figuring out how I can, you know, put the phone down, even lock it away if I need to get back to exercise. So that's something career has gone very well the last few years and life, family life and personal life is going great too. But it's just how can I make sure that I'm not losing focus yeah. Um, yeah. away from that? Yeah. Yeah. Keep that work-life mix healthy as, as life yeah. continues to evolve and work continues to evolve. That makes a lot of sense. I love it. And yeah, it, uh, I would have just retired from golf if, after a 78, like, all right, <laughs> put the scorecard in a frame. It would have been right behind me on your little shelf yeah, there. Like, all right, a... it's done. Um, <laughs> is that it? Is that actually the scorecard right there that I could see? Oh, this is, this is a little box from Tory. I was able to play Tory Pines. Oh, okay. I'm like, I see some golf stuff there. there. I, no, I, did, but... I did keep that. No, that was, yeah. So I'm trying to make sure that doesn't seem like a fluke. So when I go play league this next summer, my handicap isn't hurting me too much. So Makes <laughs> I sense. need to live up to it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Uh, Thomas, it's been awesome chatting with you a little bit, having you on the show. People can find you. Uh, I know they can find you on LinkedIn and they can probably find you a few other places. Where can people uh, learn more about Thomas McMahon? Yeah, my, I've got a personal site, thomasjmcmahon.com. You'll find me on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook with the happy scaling nomenclature. So at happy scalings, where you'll find me on pretty sure all three of those channels there. Cool. And then, yeah, I would recommend if you like this type of content that you put out, Tyler, um, the affiliated podcast that ClickBank's hosting. I'm pretty proud of what we will put out there. And the editing team there is really solid. So yeah, so we'll grab, we'll grab all of those links and throw them here in the, uh, for anyone, if you're, yeah. if you're listening to the show on, on radio, you won't be able to grab those. You just have to write them down. <laughs> but if you're on uh, businessninjaradio.com and you can, you can get all the links there uh, from Thomas's episode. So appreciate you coming out. It's been an absolute blast to all my biz ninjas, wherever you are listening, watching, streaming, whatever it may be, it's your turn to go out and do something. 
Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. Please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.